You have captured my heart, my sister, O bride. You have captured my heart with one of your glances, with but one of the strands of your necklace. How beautiful your love is, my sister, O bride. How much finer it is than wine and the fragrance of your oils than all spices. Your lips flow with fresh honey, O oh bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue and the fragrance of your clothing is like the scent of Lebanon. You are a locked garden, my sister, O oh bride, a secured well, a sealed spring, your watered fields are a pomegranate orchard with choice fruit, flowering henna with plentiful nard, nard and turmeric, sweet cane and cinnamon bark. Mm. Along with all the scented woods, mirror and aloes, along with all the best spices, a garden spring, well, a fresh water, streams from lush Lebanon. Wake up, north wind, come, south wind, breathe on my garden, let its spices flow. Let my love come to his garden and eat of its choice fruit. I have come to my garden, my sister, O oh bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spices. I have eaten of the, my honeycomb along with the honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Feast, friends, drink till you're drunk, drunk with love. Fruit gardens and vineyards are symbols of female sexuality in the ancient Near East. So when the male voice here tells us, talks about pomegranates and gardens and eating choice fruits, he's not just talking about getting some vitamins. <laughs> We just read some sexy poetry up here in church. <laughs> Not something we usually do. But what's funny is that the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon or Canticles, they're all the same thing, used to be preached on a lot. Back in the day in the Middle Ages, this was one of the texts that people wrote and preached on the most. Why? What was so important about some erotic poetry from ancient Israel? Hold on to that question. First things first, though, why am I preaching about ancient erotic poetry? <laughs> why is your Unitarian Universalist seminary intern always talking about sexuality? <laughs> because, honestly, it's a matter of life and death. Over my time here at Middle, I've come to love this community. And that means that my heart breaks every time I hear a new way that some of us are broken around sexuality. Whether it's surviving sexual abuse or assault, internalizing messages that are sexuality Sexuality is sinful. Enduring intimate partner violence. Or feeling deeply that our bodies are undesirable. There's people who've left faith communities and there's people who just aren't on this earth. Because this brokenness around sexuality has led to self-destruction, despair, violence. It's a matter of life and death. And the church needs to talk about matters of life and death. But the church has not always helped. Right? In fact, it's made things worse. This really came home for me uh, when I was in college. I went one year, my senior year, on the Rainbow Retreat. We were in one of those conference center basements, get doing the awkward getting to know you team building games. You know the one, everyone step into the circle if you're from the East Coast. 
don't know if you're from the West Coast, and, and you know, if you identify as gay, if you identify as gender non-conforming, if you, and then they get progressively more intense, right? Like, step into the circle if you're out to your family, if you're estranged from your family. And then, and this is the moment I remember, if you've ever thought that God doesn't love you because of your sexual orientation or gender identity. And I watched my, my best friend, who I know had struggled with depression, step into that circle. And I just, I just broke down. And, and I don't cry in public, I'm not a, I, I just don't do that. But there was something about seeing her face and realizing for the first time that this had been her experience and how painful that must be. That just, it just broke me open. This isn't just about gay people either. Straight people. Do you feel like the church has helped you have a healthy, holistic understanding of sexuality? <laughs> Yeah. I didn't want you to feel left out. <laughs> so, that's why the church has to talk about sex. Because we need to clean up the mess that we have made of people's lives by misusing religion. And it's not just a matter of discarding the old sort of sex-negative ways of talking about sex, right? Just to, just, we'll, we'll just stop actively haranguing against it, right? We're going to put up a pride flag, and we're just not going to read those parts of it. No. Because if we're silent on sexuality, if we're not telling any story about it, the old narrative comes in and fills up the vacuum. This because, and this goes deep. That's why we need to tell new stories. We need a new vision, and we need to articulate it from the pulpit. We need to teach comprehensive sexuality education in our church schools and facilitate ongoing discussions about sexuality with our adults, too. We need to tell new stories. And we need to tell old stories in new ways. You know what the great thing is? We don't have to look all over as a church wanting to tell a new story about sexuality. We can look in the Bible of all, of all places. Right? <laughs> so we can turn to the Old Testament and, and some past Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, but not all the way to Isaiah. Don't, don't go too far, it's a really short book. We find the Song of Solomon, this, the Song of Songs, or one, one way of translating that is the most excellent of songs. And it's short, it's a book of poetry, and it's a bunch of speeches and dialogues between two lovers, lovers who, by the way, don't seem to be married. All of this about my bride is sort of this a little bit of hyperbole. And as is the part about my sister, that was like an ancient Near Eastern term of endearment, sort of like the way we say baby. They're not, that's not really, anyway. <laughs> so it's two lovers. They don't seem to be married, and they're just celebrating their love and desire for each other. And in reading this book, you get a very different idea of what the Bible says about sexuality than the one that we're used to. This book of the Bible doesn't say bodies are shameful. Instead, the book looks at the body with love, with sensuality. Your lips distill nectar. Honey and milk are under your tongue. This part of scripture celebrates sexual love. How sweet is your love? How much better is your love than wine, and the fragrance of your oils than any spice? That word love there in Hebrew is actually 
the word that they use is actually means more like lovemaking. So it really reads something more like, making love with you is sweeter than wine. The smell of your body is better than any perfume. <laughs> I'm just reading the Bible. I, <laughs> I'm just reading the Bible. And this is powerful, right? Because we're just reading the Bible. And the fact that this is in our Bible makes a powerful statement. Even if we just read it as about human erotic love, it it's a, celebrates a vision of sexuality that's powerful and pleasurable and mutual and passionate. So the next time that someone starts talking to you about what the Bible says about sexuality, ask them what they think about the Song of Songs, and that'll be interesting. But the inclusion of the Song of Songs in our Bible has another profound truth to share with us. Do you, do you have that question from the beginning of the sermon about why the medieval commentators read this all the time? Pull that out now. The medieval preachers who preached on it read it metaphorically, um, allegorically, as a love song between God and God's people, or maybe between Christ and the soul, or Christ and the church. And on the one hand, honestly, we, mo we, we modern people, modern scholars, sometimes we think this is a little silly. Like, it seems like in its original context, the song was about human love. On the other hand, I think those medieval people were onto something. For centuries, mystics have used similar language, the language of sexuality, to talk about their yearning for God. I think it's okay for modern people of faith to start exploring this language. The other great thing about the Song of Songs is that it's a poem of mutual desire. It's not just the soul yearning for God. God is really, really, really into people, too. <laughs> like head over heels in love, like smitten. Usually when I, when I think about God's love, I, I, think, I tend to think about friendship, or maybe you're used to using thinking about God as a parent, or a sibling, and that's, those are powerful ways to speak about God. And what if God is just totally, ridiculously, irrationally captivated by us? By us. What if God can't believe God's good fortune that we love God back? Imagine God is the speaker of our passage today, saying to us, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with a glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. Your lips distill nectar. Honey and milk are under your tongue. God thinks that we are sweet, fragrant, wonderful. Love is powerful stuff. And for us human beings, love includes sexuality. So let's celebrate our sexuality, not keep it out of our churches. And be open to the possibility that God wants to have a mutual, amazing, passionate, and yes, even erotic relationship with us.